Hello, and welcome to My Week in Baseball. I'm your host, Phil Eshtruth Harrison. You're listening to episode number 17. Recent episodes are published in podcast format on Buzzsprout, Spotify, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio, while all episodes are available in a video version on YouTube. And you can contact me on Twitter at My Week in B-Ball. So you have many ways to enjoy the show. As always, thanks to R.E.S. Truth of Brunjo Productions for the intro music created especially for this show. Learn more at brunjo.com. Today, we'll talk with a longtime baseball fan of the Tigers and Red Sox. Of course, we'll also have our blast from the past and the cap of the day. So let's get right to it. Well, let me introduce today's guest. Today's guest is my brother, Andy. Uh, Andy is a longtime baseball fan of the Tigers and Red Sox, especially. Uh, we are also fantasy baseball rivals in a points league on ESPN. So welcome, Andy. Thank you. Great to be here. We really aren't uh, too much of rivals this year, though, although I think we're rivaling for last place in fantasy baseball. <laughs> Yeah, that happens sometimes. Okay, so uh, we start off each show with our cap of the day, and today's cap of the day is not a major league cap. Andy, why don't you tell us about it? Today's cap of the day is for Tufts University, and their mascot is the Jumbos. And just a couple items about Tufts to mention, they are in the New England Small College Athletic Conference. Not a traditional powerhouse that most people have heard of. Does include other schools like Amherst, which is known for very good baseball teams. Bates, Middlebury, Wesleyan, some other small private schools in the Northeast. And the Tufts baseball team is actually quite good. They've won six conference championships in the last two decades. Um, the other thing to mention is that their mascot is an elephant, which isn't the most typical kind of mascot that you see for college athletic teams, not a Viking or a Spartan. But the elephant jumbo is because one of the founding trustees and benefactors of Tufts was P.T. Barnum, the famous circuit, circus <laughs> master of the 19th century. And his star attraction was the elephant jumbo. And in fact, for many, many years, Tufts had the stuffed version of Jumbo after Jumbo passed away on campus until a fire a few decades ago, and it was replaced by a statue. Now, that's definitely some trivia there. <laughs> I don't know how many listeners will know that. Okay, so Jumbo, the elephant uh, the logo, Tufts jumbo. Tufts, the Tufts Jumbo. Excellent. So I know before the show, Andy, you and I talked about uh, a number of different topics uh, that we might discuss. So uh, one of those was uh, what were some of your favorite games, either first game you remember going to or maybe a favorite game? First game, I think, was 1977. The Tigers, it would have been with a Cub Scout group. And the Tigers, I believe, beat the Rangers. And... All of a sudden, I decided maybe this baseball thing was sort of interesting after all. I had not played Little League baseball or anything like you did. Um, so I didn't have that kind of uh, connection to the game. But after seeing a live game, I started looking at the sports page every day and just seeing what was happening. And I do remember that first season, the Tigers weren't very good that year, but they had won several games in a row toward the end of the year. And I remember thinking like, wow, they must be really good. And I didn't understand at the time that out of 162 games, if you won, you know, three or four in a row, that didn't mean you were necessarily <laughs> that good. But I was 10 and I learned and uh, the rest is history. I, I became a big fan after that. And they probably finished in fifth place that year. I'd have to look it up. But they had a lot of fifth place finishes in a, I think, seven team uh, American League East back then. I think that's about right. I think they were 74 and 88 that year. So that, that wasn't a favorite game, um, particularly, other than it sparked my interest in the sport. I guess the favorite game would have to be the 1984 World Series, Game 4, that we were lucky enough to get to go to. And I think at the time, you might remember this, you got the tickets by just mailing in a request. 
I did. Yeah. This, by random out of the lottery. This was in the old days where tickets were uh, still obtained via snail mail. There was no internet. There was no purchasing and having your tickets on your phone or online. And I was living in Ann Arbor at the time. And other people in the family were living in the Lansing area. And so the mail from Ann Arbor to Detroit was like one day. And I was <laughs> able to get the request in. And we got, uh, was it four World Series tickets back? So that was the that was a memorable game. We were sitting in left field. Tigers beat the Padres four to two. Um, the Tigers runs both came on two run homers by Alan Trammell, who was, as most people will recall, not much of a power hitter, but he did have some power. And he um, that was a time where I guess he was flashing his power. So both the home runs, I believe, went out to our part of the stadium. We were sitting in, in left field um, in the cheap seat somewhere and they won that game and then went on to win the series in the following game. Yeah, and I'll have to look that up. Uh, Alan Trammell, you don't think of him as much of a power hitter, but there he did make a change in his batting style midway through his career that really infused um, his hitting. And I'll try to look that up. That was 84. In 1984, the year the Tigers won the World Series, he had 14 home runs during the regular season. So, yeah, not uh, not a power hitter by either today's standards or the standards of that day. And then I guess one other game I would mention in terms of games that I attended that was memorable was you and I, again, were at a saw a no hitter by Jack Morris in Comiskey Park. I don't think they had changed to the new stadium at that point. It was the old Comiskey Park. Yep. Yeah. And that would have been probably 1985, I think, or 86. Anyway, right. Uh, right. You know, it might have also been 84. Let's see if I can find that out. Uh, Jack Morris. I think that was his only no hitter as far as I know. I think so. It was in April. Uh, oh, April, April 7, 1984. So okay. it was the same year they won the, the World Series. And uh, I had a friend who was from the Chicago area and uh, five or six of us ended up staying at mm -hmm. his place over a long weekend. And we went to that game that ended up being the no hitter. And what I recall about it is it didn't feel like a no-hitter because mm -hmm. in the first inning, Morris walked the bases loaded yeah. <laughs> with nobody out. And <laughs> that brought up, uh, I believe, they had the two big power hitters at that time. I think it was Greg Luzinski mm. was the number four hitter. And the way I remember it, uh, is uh, Morris induced Luzinski to hit a little tapper back to the mound. Huh. Morris threw home to Lance Parrish for the force out at the plate for one, and he threw to first. It was probably Darrell Evans or maybe Dave Bergman playing first base to get the double play, and that got two outs. And then the next batter, I think, was Ron Kittle, the, the mm. guy who had won Rookie of the Year the year before, or it was another top hitter and hit a deep fly ball to right field uh, that Kirk Gibson tracked down on the warning track for the final out of the inning. So he walked the bases loaded. It <laughs> wasn't a perfect game. And then he was lights out after that. <laughs> totally lights out. And, and near the end of the game, the Chicago fans were standing up and applauding and rooting for him to get the no, to complete the no hitter as well, which was, that was really cool. He just needed to get warmed up. <laughs> that, that was it get a few kinks out find that find that strike zone or maybe learn that umpire strike zone <laughs> for the day uh so yeah that was a good one other memories things i know one thing you and i've talked about is uh, radio versus tv how do you feel about that so i'm a dyed in the wall radio um fan i prefer listening to the game there's something about uh the announcer painting the picture for you when you can't see the picture and then you get to envision it a little bit in your mind as well but also just like the flexibility of it because to sit down in front of a tv screen for three hours seems like a big commitment and maybe i'm too restless for that unless it's a playoff game so i want to be you know i don't know when i was a kid i would just go out and shoot baskets over and over and over again have the radio game on in the background we take the radio we take the transistor radio on canoe trips 
so we could listen to the Tigers game. But we were out canoeing and enjoying the outdoors at the same time. We could keep track of the ball game. So it was just something about that was the way to consume baseball as a fan for me. And my wife sometimes turns to me and says, okay, you have an MLB subscription now. You can watch any game on TV. How come you never want to watch any games on TV? And I said, it's not fun that way. It's much more fun to listen to it on the radio. Yeah. So the games really are too long. Maybe it's the way we consume the game. Because if you consume the game on the radio, the length no longer matters. The length matters when you're watching it on TV. Yeah. And uh, because like of the big, the big uh, TV revenue, uh, MLB probably wants to suit the television audience when maybe that's not really the best medium for the sport. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's just personally the way that I would always do it. Um, it was uh, Ernie Harwell, now a Hall of Famer, and his partner Paul Carey. Those were that was the team we grew up listening to. Ernie Harwell was the voice of summer and. I would listen to the games. If they were on the West Coast, I would have radio next to my bed when I fell asleep listening to the games in the summer. Just you couldn't top Ernie Harwell, in my opinion. But I did. Ernie Harwell used a a lot of announcing techniques that are common, I'm sure, common practice. But I assumed that Ernie Harwell could never say anything that was wrong. I I found him a very trustworthy voice. So one thing that I remember is that he would routinely say things like, ah, fly ball into the stands. Uh, Oh, nice catch by a guy from Flint. And I would think like, how in the heck does he know that person's from Flint? And then the next day it would be, you know, someone from Saranac, Michigan takes that ball home. Right. Small towns. Sometimes it's kind of obscure towns. I don't think everybody has a sign in the stands. Did someone tell him, give Ernie Harwell the seating plan in advance and tell him (laughs) we're all... Like I was a guy, uh, I was a gullible kid at that point, I guess. I finally learned that he just made that up. And I was, you know, for a moment, felt he, disillusioned. He would, it only lasted for a moment. But he, he would mention the names of cities or even small towns that people were likely to be from somewhere That's in right. the stands, yeah. not necessarily that particular fan. Yeah. But it did make you feel that connection. And yeah. uh, when, he, when he would call out your hometown or something. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That was pretty special. But he was um, one of the great ones. Yeah. Sure. And Dan Dickerson uh, does a great job now. So I like listening to him as yeah. well. Just in the current Tigers team, I enjoy the rotating cast they have sometimes of former players. So Dan Petrie, who is a member of that 84 World Series championship team, is one of the guest color commentators now who's been appearing more frequently. And they have others as well. And I, I sort of enjoy getting to hear those different voices alongside the main announcer. How about uh, allegiance after you've moved, you've lived in the Boston area for quite a long time. You grew up a Tigers fan. How do you feel about the Red Sox and versus the Tigers? Oh, it's hands down the Tigers. I always maintain my original rooting loyalties in any sport. And that I, I, in terms of baseball, I, I like the Red Sox just fine. And in fact, in during the 2004 year, the miracle year when they finally broke the curse, I was as glued to the set as any Red Sox fan would have been during the playoffs in the World Series. And I remember if I had to go out grocery shopping, I'd have like, you know, I'd have my phone with me and the headphones plugged in so I could keep track of the score of the game when I was buying groceries. I, I think one of the games that Ortiz won against the Yankees in extra innings um, in that that amazing playoff series that year. Uh, happened when I was in the grocery store. <laughs> so, you know, I like the Red Sox. I admire what they've been able to do over the last 15 years or so. I go to maybe about a game a year um, at Fenway, and it's a great ballpark, but there's no question that the Tigers are my dominant loyalty. And so in the in the 2014 uh, American League Championship Series, which if you're a longtime listener, you'll know we talked about uh, a bit in a previous podcast – uh, but 2014, it was uh, Boston versus Detroit uh, in the ALCS. How did that one feel to you? I suppose that was a difficult series. It, it was it was a hard series because the Tigers had that tremendous starting pitching staff at that time, and pretty you know strong offensive players as well, and maybe perhaps their best team of that whole era from around. The I mid, think it was the mid aughts to the mid teens. And so uh, having lost two World Series, we were hoping 
at this point that, that maybe this time this team looked better than those teams and looked like it could be destined to finally break through when win that first World Series since 1984 it wasn't it wasn't to be so that series was kind of um particularly devastating <laughs> in that sense and I remember that replay they showed over and over of the critical David Ortiz home run Tory uh, Hunter Tory Hunter leaps over the wall uh, appearing at first possibly to have caught it yeah and then and then he didn't catch it so the, the so that that flip over the wall which you saw over and over again to me was the symbol of futility and it also in retrospect marked the high watermark of that of the franchise in that period of time so within the next year they were already starting on their rebuild which as you and I have talked about, has never seems to end. Yeah. Yeah. The last real, so that was 2014. The last year they contended was 2016 when they nearly made uh, the playoffs as a wild card. Okay. Um, but yeah, that really probably was the high point. And it was Max Scherzer, Justin Verlander, David Price, Annabelle okay. Sanchez, who was great back then. Uh, that Those four in the rotation and I think was Rick Percello still on the team? Uh, that was an yeah, amazing, <laughs> amazing rotation. So you have what three? Did David Price ever win the Cy Young? Three or yes, maybe I think he did. I think he did so with Toronto. If he did, then that would have been at, now they they weren't all at their peak at that moment. No, but that would have right. been four Cy Young Award winners plus Annabelle Sanchez, oh, right. who was the ERA title winner one of those years. So wow. The bullpen was the Achilles heel, as I recall. It was, yeah. 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 And and we played more station to station baseball. We had kind of a slow, a slower team, some big sluggers. Well, so how about uh favorite players? Who were who was either your your single favorite player growing up, or if you had more than one, or maybe a favorite player today, even? So growing up, it was Alan Trammell. Um, and actually I liked Lou Whitaker quite a lot too. Um, so maybe the combination together at some level, but um, I, so those two guys together, I guess, because they were often linked, um, maybe my favorite players of that era for sure growing up. And there was something special about, I think I liked them because they weren't flashy and they didn't get, even at that time, they didn't get a tremendous amount of press attention. They always were considered very good players, but they weren't the kind of guys you saw doing national commercials for Gillette razors or something like that. They just seemed like they were kind of down to earth guys who did their job, did it really, really well and kind of stayed out of the spotlight. And yeah. there was something very appealing about that particularly. Um, so and I, th I think for the whole Midwest, I mean, it's like working class Detroit, working, working class Midwest. Yeah. I mean, they really had that ethic. Yeah. Yeah. So that would, that, so those two guys for sure, and then I would say modern era or modern era, more recent era would be Justin Verlander because he's just so talented. And I think had also has such a, he seemed like such a battler um, and watching him in some of those games. I mean, I haven't followed him as closely. I know his career on the Astros has been a huge resurgence in the last several years, but when I used to listen or watch the games frequently when he was playing for the Tigers, he was just like bear down and he you'd think that maybe he was starting to get in trouble in the sixth inning or the seventh inning and he'd look a little bit shaky and then he'd just kick it into a higher gear and stick around until the eighth or sometimes the ninth like he just wasn't going to lose and there were some great games he pitched against the yankees in the uh divisional series um champ playoffs that just were real standouts, I think. And, and, and Oakland, like it, he was, he was like they were, against Oakland. felt like they weren't going to lose if they had Justin Verlander pitching. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, I, if you were going to beat him, and maybe still true today, you had to beat him early. I remember a game that you and I took our families to at Comerica Park uh, mm. some, some years back. Verlander was pitching, and we got to the game a little late, and we were just sitting down in the top of the first inning. And I don't now remember who they, oh, they might've been playing Oakland, but anyhow, in the first inning, just as we were sitting down, he gave up a home run mm -hmm. and two batters later, he gave up another home run and we were down two to nothing after one inning. And we thought, Oh, wow. I yeah, guess Verlander's got an off day. 
we ended up one and five to two. I mean, <laughs> he gets he gets better. It's like it takes him that first inning to warm up. Yeah. And I couldn't what I what I remember about him particularly was I think the speed of his pitches picked up as he went along. And because of the way that they're so careful and cautious with pitch, pitch, pitchers these days, it surprised me that you'd have a guy who was probably over 100 pitch count at that point. This would have been maybe 10 years ago. I don't know. He's probably not going as deep now as he used to. But he would be – his fastball would pick up speed in like the seventh or the eighth inning. And I was just like – when usually they'd be yanking guys out of games worried about their arm, he was kicking into a higher gear. I, yeah, I, I, yeah, I've never heard him say this, but I think that he may approach the game a little bit more like a marathoner or a, a runner approaches a long run, where you know it's a long run, and you're going to put your best effort out, but you are not going to give 100% of your velocity, or you're not going to go out sprinting if you're a runner, and you save a little of that because you know you want to go seven innings or eight innings. And, and and so he knows that, and so he's not going out there. He, he know it's not he's not a, coming in for one inning, inning of relief. He he has a long game plan that he's thinking of. Well, let's get back to Lou Whitaker a little bit. You mentioned Whitaker being one of your favorites, and I think there was a time where I know we referred to them as Tramaker, and I think that was a common terminology. It's like Trammel and Whitaker were almost one because they were so integral in turning those double plays and playing that middle infield on uh, the Keystone for so many for decades. Mm -hmm. And I know recently uh, Detroit retired Lou Whitaker's number, number one, and that was a big deal. It was a sellout in Detroit. I believe it was the only sellout of this year Mm -hmm. and great honor to him and really a great honor to us to get to see him play so well all those years. Um, I remember there was a time when uh, we waited in a line, a very long line, I think, and you got his autograph. Yeah, they used to, you know, it it was one of those days where there was like, you know, autograph day at the ballpark and Whitaker was the player. And I think they had, I think the Tigers coach, Dick Trzewski, was another one who was doing autographs that day. And um, yeah, the prize obviously was getting Whitaker's autograph. So that was uh, that was a highlight. Uh, I didn't have a lot of of sports autographs or memorabilia, but that was definitely in baseball terms. That was a big highlight for me. And um, I think he would have, you know, usually the athletes at that point would use their, their common nicknames. And so I I believe he wrote it out as sweet Lou Whitaker, um, not just Lou Whitaker. And I also remember, of course, players with a name that sounds like close to boo if you had fans that were in the stadium who maybe were from, from out of town or didn't go to games very often or didn't follow baseball that closely, I, you'd often hear people, everyone, of course, when Lou Whitaker would step up to bat, would start saying, Lou, Lou. I remember someone a couple rows behind me saying, like, why are they booing that second baseman all the time? And they yeah, just, and it was <laughs> Lou, just kind of Lou. Like so Lou, it's another Lou. thing about Lou is too close to boo. I think that's probably happened with other athletes as well with a similar name, but that always standed, stood out for me. And I just remember shaking my head thinking, you just don't follow baseball, do you? Right. And do you remember what, what did you get autographed? Uh, it was like, I think it was like a, probably a business card scrap of paper, but it was probably one of our dad's business cards. Okay. Uh, the back of a card, something like that. It I was, think I, I think I had a tiger yearbook and I know I have Dick Trzewski's oh. autograph, which is not nearly as big a deal. I have to look to see if Lou Whitaker's is in there. Yeah, good point. I'll have to see. I'll have to check myself now. So I think as long as we're on the Trammell and Whitaker thing, this would be a good thing for this would be the place in the broadcast where we mm-hmm. typically have our blimerick. That's our baseball limerick, which I always say that we have every broadcast. However, today it won't be a blimerick. It'll be more of a muse, a short musical number, uh, mm-hmm. because back in. Do you remember what year it was, Andy? Uh, probably been about 83 or 84, somewhere in there. Yeah. Okay. So back in the early to mid eighties, uh, Andy wrote a, a song and I, and I think I'm trying to remember why you picked the tune, the entertainer and the, the, the basic tune goes uh, now the curtain is going up. The entertainer is taking a bow. 
And that was kind of a ragtime piece. And I don't know if that was because the movie The Sting with Robert Redford was popular at that time. I'm not quite sure where that came from. It was that after that movie, The Sting, which was a very popular movie in the mid 70s, um, ragtime had a little bit of a resurgence, I think. And so we, I don't know, either sing it or hear it around our household. I feel like we might have had an album or a tape one of our parents might have bought that was um, the soundtrack to The Sting or something. So Scott Joplin was having a little bit of a resurgence. And so that had been something I knew from my youth and somehow that I liked it. It's catchy. And it came into mind when I was trying to think of a way to pay um, homage to Tramaker. Right. So we'll sing it for you here in a minute. But a little bit more of the background is, Andy, that you wrote this out. And if I recall, you sent it to the Tigers? Yeah, so I wrote just to this little part of the entertainer, I guess the refrain, uh, to the music. I just wrote lyrics um, honoring Trammell and Whitaker. And I sent the lyrics to Ernie Harwell directly. So I did get a nice short note back from him saying he appreciated it and... So that was very cool. And I think I have that letter somewhere from Ernie Harwell. That was the only point at which I have composed lyrics in my life to anything. So <laughs> I guess I was particularly inspired. And so this is Andy's ode to Lou Whitaker and Alan Trammell sung to the tune of Scott Joplin's The Entertainer. Now the pitcher is winding up. The second baseman is taking a bow. Grabs a grounder and spears a shot. That second baseman, he sure can do a lot. And his partner, who plays at short, sure does a great job of holding the fort. Snappy fielding and speed, oh, they can hold any lead. The keystone combo, the stars of the team. So that's a good one, Andy. It's really well written. Thank you. Thank you. And so that's all for today, my friends. Join us next time, because honestly, what can be better than talking baseball? Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Phil S. Truth Harrison. We'll see you next time on My Week in Baseball. Mm -hmm.